Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, uh, welcome everybody to the afternoon session. My name is Tom Ball. I'm from Microsoft Research in Redmond, where I head the Software Reliability Research Group. I've been at Microsoft for 12 years this August, and before that I was, uh, I was at Bell Labs for six years. Um, so today I'm going to tell you about sort of a team effort to put, put together some courseware and a company set of tools uh, for um, uh, upper level undergraduate course on parallel and concurrent programming um, with a focus uh, mainly on correctness, although a little bit on performance. It's, that's why, why we often do parallel programming. Uh, and um, also to tell you a little bit about uh, what's available now on .NET. Um, the, the source code for the courseware as, long as, as well as the accompanying tools are on these two URLs. And this slide deck will be available later online, so you, you don't have to type those in now. Uh, this is joint work. Uh, between a team of people at Microsoft Research, including myself, Sebastian Burkhart, um, Madhav Musavathi, Shaz Kadir, and the University of Utah, represented by today by Ganesh Gopalakrishnan and his student Joseph Mayo, who's joining Microsoft uh, in a few months. And also, um, we had some work from uh, University of California, Santa Cruz, by Caitlin uh, Sadowski. So, uh, very quickly, I'll uh, give you some context and motivation and tell you a little bit more about the courseware. If we have some time, I'll, I'll do a demo of some of the tooling. Um, so this is an obligatory graph from Burton Smith that uh, most everybody should be quite familiar with about all the various trends uh, over, over the last decade uh, and sort of the, the news as, as he told it and others, the free lunch sort of running out uh, in the sense that while Moore's Law continues its inevitable growth and sort of doubling uh, the transistor, transistor density, we see that uh, clock speed and, and power and performance per, per clock have, have all, have all uh, leveled out. So we've run into various walls, uh, a power wall, which means that uh, without, without creating a little nuclear, nuclear disaster on our processor, uh, we can't clock the processors faster. Um, we have a memory wall where many of our applications workloads are their, are their performances dominated by memory access time, and going off chip is so much slower than staying on chip. And then we, we have sort of squeezed the rock for all the water that's in it, so there's not much parallelism left uh, in single-threaded execution that we haven't found already through various uh, fancy forms of speculation. So it's, it's hard to find the extra work in there. And all these things add up to a very hard, hard brick wall. Um, that, as you know, we've reached and uh, are currently in the process of smashing into. Um, the response, response number one by the industry is to do the easy thing, uh, which we all have now on our laptops, uh, on our smartphones, is to, is to duplicate the cores in their various uh, uh, ways uh, that, that one can go about doing this with the memory and sharing of, of, uh, of caches. Uh, but the basic idea is, uh, uh, is, to, is to duplicate the hardware to give us uh, multiple cores of execution and then uh, hope that, that we will figure out um, you know, how, to, how to program this. So this leads sort of this gaping question, which has obviously been a gaping question for decades. Um, I, I found an article in the communications of the ACM that points out one way that we go after this. And this is from this nice article by Cole and Williams about uh, these are two fellows who are in charge of Photoshop, which uh, uh, is all about image manipulation, and they really care about performance. Um, so they say, as processors get more cores and grow in complexity, the need will only intensify for new tools and better programming primitives for hiding the complexity from developers and allowing them to code at higher levels of, of abstraction. Um, now, the, the multi-cores are here and now. What are those, how are those new, new, new abstractions embodied? Well, uh, they're, they're basically in libraries, okay, for better or worse. We don't have sort of, uh, like we had with structured programming or object-oriented programming, we don't have a, a language solution that comes that meets the needs of many people across many diverse uh, uh, um, 
uh, domain. So uh, what we get are lots of libraries. And uh, the uh, Cole and Williams say the more we can hide under the more library layers, the more about the specifics of the hardware um, and the optimizations that, are, are, that can be done, the better. Uh, and they say, you know, every parallel library implementation of common algorithms uh, is great, you know, is greatly appreciated. So we can sort of s slide out our old sequential implementation and slide in this new parallel one if, if life were, were only that uh, simple. But this is essentially sort of the industry response. Give us more libraries. And in fact, the industry has re responded. So response number two uh, has been in the making for, again, about as, as long as uh, the multi-core uh, revolution. Uh, but we have things like Boost, which has been around for a while. We have Intel's thread building blocks. We have java.util.concurrent. We have Microsoft.net. 4.0. These are all libraries that, uh, that take ideas from research, for example, uh, work stealing algorithms that work quite nicely on multi-cores and sort of push them down and give you higher level abstractions at the library level uh, to do parallel programming with. So uh, in, this, in this world, you're using a general purpose programming language and your abstractions are provided by uh, these higher level uh, abstractions of libraries. So for example, in .NET 4, um, we have demoted threads to something very low level in the system that we hope fewer and fewer programmers program with. Um, on top of that, we've, we've put various libraries to hide the explicit thread creation um, with uh, certain parallel constructs, certain scheduling algorithms, certain data structures that are not only thread safe, but they're uh, they take advantage of multi-threaded execution to make uh, operations go faster. Even a higher level, we give data, we give declarative uh, languages like Link, which if, if you're familiar with, it's our way of doing queries against structured data in .NET. Uh, we now have the ability to do parallel Link. So take a Link query, which used to be sequential, uh, and you can automatically get it parallelized. Excuse me. Um, then all this is done at the .NET, .NET level, which means that all the languages that compile into .NET can leverage these new levels of, of abstraction. Okay, so that's that's the that's the good part of the story. Um, and here's maybe you know uh, how easy it is the sunny day scenario. So suppose you're rendering this scene of ray tracing, shooting uh, rays of light into. Uh, it seems I have a uh, animation. Uh, somebody's turned on. Let me not uh, do that or stop hitting the touchpad. Okay. I don't know which of the two is going on. So we have a sequential ray tracing, which is tracing for every row and then every column, tracing a ray into the scene and then get, giving a color to the pixel at that coordinate. Um, and if you want to parallelize that, well, it turns out that trace ray is sort of a, a very independent uh, 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 call, and you can essentially just replace the for loop with a, a call to a library, parallel.4, converting the inner body into a lambda expression, okay? Um, and in this case, gain a lot of speed up. So um, the good part is it, it, it looks very familiar. Uh, the bad part is it's completely different semantics, and you have to worry about things like data races, and the language doesn't tell you at all about all the gotchas. And so I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that when we get into the courseware. So uh, uh, and, and th let me say this parallel.4 idea. This is not new to Microsoft. This is just our implementation of a common programming pattern at, at the library level. OK. So our courseware is about minding your P's and C's. Uh, we actually not only talk about parallelism for thinking of speed up and concurrency uh, or asynchrony for responsiveness. So, so the two parts of performance, uh, roughly speaking, uh, uh, through, throughput and uh, latency. Uh, but in the course, we really want to emphasize correctness. Uh, and in this case, because we are uh, adopting a library approach where fundamentally many, many sort of things can go wrong um, when even the students apply simple transformations to programs. So for example, if your loops aren't independent, if there are data races between them and you do a parallel four, you can be in trouble. So we think 
especially in this world of the libraries on the multi-core, it's especially important for students to be familiar with uh, new forms of correctness uh, issues. And so in the course, we emphasize uh, a number of these, and we, we have tool support uh, that I'll show you in a little bit um, to make these, ex uh, these explicit to the student. So that's sort of the idea of, uh, of, the, course, of the course at a high level. We want to we wanna get performance through parallelism and concurrency using this library-based approach, but correctness uh, is, is even more of an issue in this, in this world because we're, we're using libraries embedded in a general purpose language. Okay, so what the uh, courseware is, is eight units, about 16 weeks of material, excuse me, uh, which encompasses slides, lecture notes, quizzes. The quizzes are available uh, by sending us email. We don't put them on the, on the website. Uh, instructors can email us. Uh, we have sample programs and applications that come uh, that come along, a lot of them come from uh, the .NET repository. And then we have created sets of tests and tools uh, to illustrate mainly the correctness issues, although we have some performance technology built into Visual Studio as well. Uh, it's, it's more of a senior level course. Prerequisites are that you have some, uh, that you have OO programming background, you've seen data structures, you've probably heard of what a thread is already, sort of have your basic operating system. So I would say it's more uh, upper level upper level course. And it, it uh, depends on Visual Studio 2010. We uh, work on top of .NET 4 with C Sharp and F Sharp. Although you could get by, and we do have people who are teaching it, just using the express, express versions of, of, the, of the technology um, uh, for C Sharp. And for F Sharp, you can, you can download uh, F Sharp independent one. Um, so for each, each lecture, we, we try to call out the concepts at a high level that are independent. Uh, of, uh, of the particular platform. So, for example, in lecture, in the, in the first unit lecture, we talk a lot about uh, Amdahl's law and we talk about work and span and a directed acyclic model of parallel execution. Uh, these are performance concepts. We talk about uh, the notion of a happens before graph as constraining uh, the execution order of, of actions in a parallel program. And then, uh, and then we show how these two things get, uh, can, can, we can look at, in particular in .NET, uh, the use of C sharp lambdas and parallel.4 to create essentially a dynamic dependence graph for parallelism and think about wh where do we get or lose performance and, and how do we reason about uh, parallel.4 compared to a sequential for loop. So for each lecture, we try to break out what are the platform independent concepts and then uh, obviously we're, we're doing this in .NET, so we have some code concepts as well. But this thing could be retargeted for other languages. Uh, we, we just haven't done that ourselves. Uh, units one through four, I would say, are more at the high level. We talk about what I call imperative data parallel programming, where we think of a parallel, parallel programming for imperative languages like C Sharp with parallel for loops with tasks instead of threads. Uh, since we're on a multi-core, we spend a good deal of time on shared memory on what's the data race, what are locks, what are particular patterns uh, for dealing with shared memory, and of course, cache and performance issues. Um, since a lot of people will still be building platform libraries, we're not all consumers of these libraries, but students will create these new parallel algorithms that people like the, the Photoshop uh, application writers would like to use. We, we, have a, we have a unit on concurrent components. How do you create a component that is, is safe What's the notion of safety under multi-threading, and, uh, and how do you go about doing that? Uh, then we have another unit which is emphasizing more the functional side to parallelism, where we uh, look at link, we look at F-sharp, and we also look at uh, array-based array parallelization uh, with a, a library from Microsoft Research called Accelerator. Units five through eight are more diving into the details. Uh, What's actually going on under the hood with scheduling and synchronization? Uh, how do we actually get a user interface on top of a parallel system and have that make sense? Unit six, uh, Ganesh and his colleagues have worked on message passing because as, as uh, the computers grow bigger, the illusion of shared memory goes away and one has to have a notion of, of passing messages around and that will be with us for some time. And then we have a number of advanced topics in unit eight around memory models, lock free data structures and the like. Uh, the units are organized here with dependencies, so you can sort of do an a la carte uh, 
And, uh, and so you don't have to do the whole course. You can, if you wanted to just do data parallelism, the imperative and the functional style, you could do those two units without doing any, any of the others. Um, so we've tried to organize things in a way that allows you to take out many interesting subsets of the, uh, of the units. Uh, in terms of what we're, we're uh, producing for you, it's, there's quite a lot. Obviously, what Microsoft ships, Visual Studio with the C-sharp and F-sharp languages, .NET 4. We use a bunch of other libraries in, in, the, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the courseware. Um, they're all freely downloadable. Accelerator is this library from Microsoft Research that does just-in-time compiling for GPUs. Uh, Code Contracts is the way we do specifications for .NET. Um, Reactive Extensions is, is, is something fairly new. It's been out for actually a year or two now uh, for doing reactive programming on .NET from Eric Meyer and his team. Then we've created, uh, on top of some of our tools for concurrency testing and debugging, uh, a tool that I'll demo quickly called Alpaca. Uh, we have code for all our units with tests, and the tests allow us to demonstrate what's a data race, what's a deadlock, what's determinism, uh, what's a linearizability. Um, we have lots of samples that come with the parallel framework that we've adapted. And also there's a book, not done by us, but by Abe Miller and his team at Microsoft. And so that, that book has a .NET version and also just recently uh, uh, put out is a, is a version for uh, C++. And the books uh, and all the material are actually um, available as well on the web. So this is our website for the courseware. This is our website for the, the uh, code for the tool. Uh, ISP.NET is from Ganesh and his colleagues. It's a model checker for M MPI programs. Um, then we have these two books, which you can download uh, either online or with samples. Um, and there's one for .NET and one for C++. So we're making a ton available, not just through, through our team, but through, through all of, of Microsoft. Um, we've, we've, we've taught portions of the course, uh, Ganesh and colleagues at Utah, he'll tell you more about that. Um, we have other people um, teaching at the UW uh, this winter and some other folks uh, as well. So we're getting feedback and, we, and Caitlin helped us uh, devise some uh, surveys that we're also uh, make available to instructors. So let me talk quickly, quickly, how quickly should I talk? Um, what time did we start? We started at 15 after, yes. Let me t talk very quickly about some of the principles. Again, the, there's so many ways to approach the topic. We sort of go top down. So we start with these higher level abstractions provided by the libraries. We want to show students it's possible to get speed up with, with nice sunny day examples, right? We, we start with some things to show them there, there's, there's potential for this parallelism. We think that's it's always highly motivating to be able to speed up uh, your program. We emphasize productivity, so rather than digging into how do you implement a lock or sort of other sort of bottom-up approaches, what's a volatile variable, we start with a higher level of abstraction, um, task parallelism, not threads, array algorithms, not CUDA, et cetera. So we emphasize sort of the productivity angle. Uh, uh, of course, we, we look in the, into the performance gotchas as well, but we, we start with a higher level concept of what are the abstractions? What's a parallel for loop? What's its semantics, right? How do you reason about that compared to a for loop? And then start to think about later on um, peeling back uh, the abstraction to understand uh, both performance and correctness. So for example, unit five, we talk about what's going on in the library, load balancing, work stealing, the issues of data locality and false sharing, the overhead of taking a lock, uh, memory bottlenecks. So uh, we first start with, let's understand the primitives at a high level, uh, and then when you get into trouble with the performance bottleneck, to understand sort of what the main axes are that you should uh, understand to sort of diagnose performance problems. Uh, of course, we also want to understand the lower, lower level to understand how to build high-performing, high higher-level abstractions. Um, so for example, in unit five, we have, uh, we have an example of how to build a, a thread-safe buffer using some of the lower level uh, primitives available in, in .NET. As I said, we emphasize correctness. Multi-core programming is hard. There's new bug types. There's unpredictable bugs. The, those that are not obviously deficient um, are programs that are not obviously deficient, um, uh, to quote Tony. Um, and uh, severe bugs. Uh, so um, the Photoshop article had a really nice example um, I won't tell you the whole detail. You can read it about it in the ACM article. They said the single longest lived bug in Photoshop 
hid out in asynchronous I.O. for about 10 years. And the story is quite interesting. It has to do with porting from the Mac to Windows. So it's not necessarily that it was a problem in Windows, but somehow porting from one platform to another introduced the problem. And uh, you can go read about it. So uh, we have all these war stories from inside Microsoft and, and lots of data that says these sort of bugs are hard. So when we're you know, introducing all these new knives to allow people slice and dice their computation and parallelize it, we're, 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 we're giving them lots of new ways to cut themselves. So we talk about you know, things that we feel are very good things, like programming without data races at all, not even benign ones, whatever, whatever that means. Um, so we emphasize a data race free discipline through the course, uh, which we believe is already best practice for many, not all programmers. And, and we think of data races as becoming sort of like the buffer overflows where b b buffer overflows before computers were connected on the internet were just sort of this nuisance that stopped your program uh, once in a while. But the, once they became attack vectors, you know, in early 2000s when I joined Microsoft and we had this thing called Code Red, people, people became a little bit more concerned about the buffer overflow. And I feel one day people will feel the same way about data races. There was some age where we had them and people made all, waved their hands and said they were, weren't really a problem. But I think, you know, as we, as we go on to more exotic architectures with, with different memory models, just having a data race means you don't know what your program is going to do fundamentally. Um, other concepts, atomicity, uh, linearizability, we cover, we cover a lot of these. Um, determinism, and we have a contract for looking at that. Let me just try to give you a little bit of a flavor of the tool. Um, so we want to take a tool-based approach. We want to give the definitions in the course, let people know what are these new bug types, but give them examples and give them uh, code to work with and tooling that supports all these, these funky new concepts that th they're going to be learning. Um, so this tool uh, is a, is a unit-based uh, method for concurrency testing uh, called Alpaca. Uh, and let me just demonstrate that uh, just very briefly for you now. So, um, so each unit of our, uh, each unit of our, of, of the courseware comes with a solution. So this is the solution for unit two. Um, and here, what, what I've done is created a very bad piece of code, but, but it does have a, it does have a uh, semantics under .NET. And what it does is it uh, creates two threads. And the first thread is going to increment x, which is initially zero and is a shared variable, twice without any form of protection by locks. And then uh, the other thread uh, is multiplying x by twice, two times, is multiplying x by two, two times. Uh, and these two threads are going to be started in parallel by the main thread and then joined. And there's really no assertion at the end of this. Um, I don't know what you would assert. Can you think about it? OK, so, so when we run this uh, just under normal testing, um, we, we would get many, many potentially different behaviors. But what our, our technology lets us do is to put um, attributes on this test method and say what we'd like to do. So in this case, we're telling it we'd like to um, visit all the schedules where we preempt, we preempt after before and after every uh, memory access, but we only give the scheduler a preemption budget of one. So this is a very concise way to, to state a space of schedules. And those schedules will be explored in a deterministic way. Um, this other unit test method just says, does this, does this, uh, does this method contain data races? And uh, so it, has, it doesn't say anything about schedules. It just says, turn on data race detection and assert that there are no data races. Because remember, that's our, that's our motto. So, so here in the Alpaca, I have a little test runner. I'm going to say, run these two tests. And it's going to run them. And uh, if you have multiple cores on your machine, it should run them in parallel. Um, OK, so, so the first thing is not a big surprise. We have data races in our code. Because as you saw, there was no synchronization. We can pick one of the data races. Uh, we can say, please, uh, please reproduce that and show it to me. Um, and then the student can get a, multi, a view of the source code with the three threads side by side. And on the left-hand side, we have a trace, which shows the main thread starting and, and joining. It shows uh, this middle thread, which uh, my font is a little too big. 
It shows this middle thread, what is, is, what it, what is it doing? Uh, it's incrementing x at that point in the trace. And this other thread is multiplying by 2. So fundamentally, it's identifying two, two rights to x that are the racing rights. There are many other races. But, uh, but this, uh, this graphical presentation is something that, that uh, uh, when we find a bug, we actually present a deterministic schedule, a schedule that takes the student step by step through the program to show them, uh, to show them the bug, in, in this case, the data race. Um, another question you might have is, well, what are the possible, what are the possible, um, what are the possible outputs of the program? So in the schedule test, we can see that uh, it ran a number of times. So remember, we told it to use pre one preemption and to preempt after every memory access. So we see in one execution, we had a final value of 8 for x. Uh, eight, 8, 8 was very popular for a while. Oh, 5, 5 is a possible value. 2, 2 is a possible value. Zero is a possible value. You should think about that. Uh, hmm? Where are the negatives? Um, in this case, I don't think you'll get them. But what you can do actually in our, in our graphical user interface is you can actually view all the schedules. So here, in this case, each column now represents a run of the program where, whoop, where did it go? Yeah, you have to think about that, OK? That's, a, that's homework. OK, so the main thread, here the main thread is executing. It's blocking. One of the child threads is executing. Then uh, the other child thread is executing. What do these orange bubbles represent? Remember, I told it to use one preemption. So those orange bubbles represent the place where uh, a preemption got inserted. And so this is all completely deterministic. So we think this is a really nice way for students to first get introduced to concurrency, right? Not to have just surprising behavior, but to have total control. So here you actually see the events um, of, the, uh, uh, of the execution. And, um, and one of these traces might give you the clue to why you get zero. I'm just thinking that one might be about it. But anyway. Um, that's, the, that's a, just a little bit of the tooling. As you can see, we have tons of tests. In each of them, we have properties, all sorts of good, goodness there. OK, I need to finish up in three minutes, so Ganesh can take the floor. So I showed you just um, two of the tests. We have, again, determinism testing, linearizability, race detection, normal sequential unit testing. Uh, and then we also have, because we do think about performance a little bit, we have a nice uh, performance test method, so a way to collect up multiple runs and, and average the results and give you a visual feedback. Oh, this is what the performance testing looks like. Uh, visual Studio has a much more extensive framework for, uh, for um, performance, but we just extracted sort of a little bit that we wanted to package up in our, in our, uh, in our tooling. Um, the, 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 fifth, the fifth sort of uh, idea, maybe for more advanced students, if you were going on to do research or you were offering this courseware in, say, a beginning graduate course, is that there's a lot of goodness here uh, to expose the students to new research ideas. So the underlying, the underlying technology, chess, code contracts, accelerator, um, all these are from Microsoft Research and actively under development with individuals you can contact and papers you can read. For example, chess, we have the source code release. People can extend it and have extended it. We have a bunch of papers students can read about. So we, we're making all the source code available and in, in the hope that people who are, are maybe using the courseware for a little bit more research-oriented uh, efforts you know, can build on it and do uh, assign projects not just to do parallel programming, but also to improve the state of the art in, uh, in programming uh, uh, tools for, for debugging. OK, so that's, that's, our, uh, that's the courseware, sort of high level of abstractions, uh, uh, emphasize platform independence, uh, perform platform independent concepts of performance and correctness. At the bottom, of course, supported with a platform, .NET, uh, code samples, uh, libraries, uh, libraries all the way through. 
Um, some, no, some nice stuff I, I, I skipped over if you were here this morning, Don San. We do touch a little bit on async, which is, which is quite nice for uh, asynchronous programming. And then the tooling, which uh, is uh, represented by the alpaca there. Okay, thanks very much. And I'll take questions. Why don't I take questions now while Ganesh is getting set up? Yes, Walter. Um, it seems like uh, everybody is um, trying to put heroism in by library. Yes, uh, that, well, that's, that's, that seems to work. that's the short term. That's, that's what's expeditious right now. But a lot of other people are pursuing really interesting language and compiler techniques, and, and we're doing that as well. But I, I, I don't think that stuff's ready right now to sort of be taught, uh, except maybe in more advanced research-oriented classes. At, at least, I, I mean, you could take stream it and teach it to students, right? You could, you could teach, a, you could teach a, you could, I mean, if you look at the number of different language technologies for parallelism, I mean, which one do you start with? Um, Fortress, I mean, there's just so much. So I think when you look at sort of task-level parallelism supported by work stealing, if you look at something that's a cross-platform, there, there, that's one thing you can say, oh, wherever I go, I'm going to have that abstraction. If you're going to talk about parallel reduction and scan, yep, all the platforms support that. So, so I think you know, there's basic concepts, parallel for loops. You can find all these things, but they're all embedded in, in libraries be, because that's, that's the way they're, they're mul they go multi-platform right now. But that's not to say there aren't tons of other ideas that you know, we, we want the students to get explored to. But, but here, you should think of this course as sort of, it's coming from the research perspective, but it's very much grounded in sort of what Microsoft is delivering today with a little bit of research, research sprinkling more around the tooling, more around the tooling. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Kim. Yeah, hello. <laughs> so how do you see this course? Uh, so the prerequisites were very small, like object-oriented programming, data structures. Uh, and then you, are, you meet this wild world of concurrency at a very, I would say, very, very, uh, you know, wild level. I mean, it's really, you know, you have your flash and everything. Yeah, well, hopefully you've had operating systems yeah. before. Yeah. So with, you yeah. haven't, yeah. it's not a total surprise. Yeah, well, okay, so, but there are, of course, more abstract ways of reasoning, of learning about concurrency, concurrency theory. Oh, sure, sure. So how do you see such this, this course fitting? Yeah, that, that's, a very, that's a very good question. I mean, th this certainly has the American perspective. Uh, doesn't it? I, I was I was thinking of uh, uh, a what a well uh, yeah you know should you sh should you learn about you know process algebra and should you learn about you know what should you learn first uh, uh, right so so I think that that that's a very good thing for academics such as yourself to ponder um, I, I, it 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 it's sort of it's too much to fit maybe we can maybe we can chat about that but um, no I think there is a question that I've talked about with many which is. If, if you really believe parallelism is just, that sequential is just a, a special case of parallelism that's just been dominant for historical reasons, and, and now we're really, we're really in the general case, and everybody should be learning the general case rather than special case, right? Then, then you should think about it through the whole curriculum, and maybe you should also think about it through K, K through 12. So when I talk to people, it, it's very easy to introduce parallelism. Uh, you know, you, you, you can talk, well, this, is, this will date me, but in, in the old days, you know, when we didn't have cell phones and Facebook, there was a thing called the calling tree. Do you remember what a calling tree was? Sure, sure, sure. So you had a party for 100 people, but how, you don't want to call to 100 people, so you divide up the list amongst 10 friends, and each of them do something, and then you parallelize it, and you're going to get called back many times, and you're going to have to deal with missed calls and all that. So, so you know, the concepts could be introduced at a very early age, and in and, and some sense, the algebra, the algebra that we teach uh, underpins, of course, parallelism as well. So uh, within the university, then there's a question like, do you introduce parallelism as a special course, or do you thread it through architecture operating system? So there's lots, I, I think there's lots to discuss, and there's lots going on uh, that, that we, can, we can chat about. Um, so many, many different angles. And with that, I should probably stop. We can take more questions at the end and, and let my colleague Ganesh uh, uh, continue. So can we, uh, can we let Ganesh have the floor? And then we'll, we'll, we'll return to your questions at the, at the, end, of the, at the end of the lecture. OK? Is that, a there? <laughs> Is that OK? Yeah. OK. Thank you.
No. No. We're we're using we're using we're using bounded model checking. Chess yes. is a bounded model checker. So. Uh, and uh, do you check against uh, deadlocks? Yes, we check we check for deadlocks. Yeah. We, Yes, yes, I'm aware of that. Oh, yes, thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. So I would like to narrate some of uh, the experiences uh, we had in uh, having hosting a pilot offering of PPCP practical parallel and concurrent programming. I'm Ganesh Gopal Krishnan, and uh, I would like to outline what we managed to do within one semester and the manner in which to, it was offered. Um, we, I would like to touch on what else we could do if we were to uh, offer this course again, host it again at Utah or uh, at other places. And also, it'll be good to think of how such a course situates itself within the broader context of parallelism and concurrency, because obviously this activity is happening at the very high end in terms of cloud and high performance computing clusters, and also in the embedded space. And clearly this is a niche that we have picked, which is sort of in the middle, which addresses ordinary day-to-day -day programming needs uh, experienced by several programmers. So the course itself was, was run as a pilot, and it was a forcing function largely to focus on uh, creating the slides and getting the tooling in order. And um, I was very fortunate that uh, assigned, uh, folks from MSR agreed to visit uh, Utah, one uh, visitor every week. And it was nicely coupled with a distinguished lecture series that I organized. So a big thank you to all the visitors who came to Utah, gave a lecture in the PPCP as well as in this distinguished lecture. And uh, it was an incredible experience for all of us, including the students. So we would like to have this uh, kind of a offering happen again. And I have some candidates mentioned as to who I would like to invite next time around. <laughs> so look, looking forward to that. And it was also interspersed with uh, lectures from other uh, prominent players in this space. So we didn't cover just the Microsoft technologies. We also had Tim Matson uh, come and uh, talk about Intel technologies and several researchers from the FPGA camp and the embedded systems camp. All right, so I was mainly a facilitator in chief, uh, a convenient role to play because uh, I had a, my own uh, normal course offerings uh, to deal with. Uh, next time I hope to have more free time on my calendar. But uh, I had an incredible support team of uh, three able student assistants, uh, one of whom did a summer internship at MSR, Joe Mayo, and subsequently came armed with uh, inside knowledge about the tooling. And uh, so these students were pretty much responsible for uh, getting the Alpaca tool support, and uh, many of the homeworks and uh, assignments were done in collaboration, but they did the detailing work in terms of uh, making uh, these examples work in an actual Visual Studio environment, and so on. So a lot of uh, the course material is posted on our web page. And uh, as and when uh, the material becomes uh, uh, thoroughly reviewed, we will move it to the CodePlex site. That is the plan. Uh, the class was taken by roughly 10. Uh, many of them were curious about the class, and others were more uh, de uh, in, uh, involved in greater depth. So once luck varies, so when you offer a special topics class with a once a week lecture schedule and so on, uh, roughly half the class had some .NET experience. Um, all of them had object-oriented programming experience, but many of them hadn't seen managed languages very much. They had pretty much a C++ C++ kind of a, a background. So our observation was that people, of course, who are f familiar with the Microsoft technologies uh, were in this offering at least be uh, were able to take the material and run uh, just because we had a Visual Studio component uh, that were involved in some of the assignments. But uh, clearly the availability of Alpaca and the other toolings made uh, it a very neutral playing ground for pretty much anybody who put in some effort. So uh, without too much trouble, these other students who weren't uh, familiar with managed programming and so on were brought up to speed. So that was not a uh, real impediment in any way. Um, so 
at Utah, since, since so many of us uh, here uh, were discussing interesting questions about what else goes on in a department, an academic department, and which other courses are competing for this spot, that is a really valid issue. Uh, we need to we we offer a traditional form of verification course at Utah in terms of graduate students uh, knowing about concurrency theory. But this material was pitched at uh, advanced undergraduates and beginning graduate students, not necessarily coming from a formal methods uh, perspective, concurrency uh, perspective. Uh, in addition, we have uh, three other classes at least uh, going on in our department. And so if we were to offer such a class again, we had to sort of uh, rethink the role or the uh, offering schedule for this class, PPCP class. And I would perceive this to be a problem in other departments also. So for instance, we have a course on MPI and high performance computing, emphasizing high-end parallel programming. This is one course that is routinely offered. Uh, there is a traditional multi-core and parallel programming class, so emphasizing open MP and uh, very performance-driven offering that too, in terms of uh, how locality matters, how caching hierarchies are changing in the, with the advent of multi-core and so on. A third kind of class, uh, we are very fortunate to have this uh, richness, a third class which offers uh, an in-depth look at GPU programming. But uh, despite that, I think that a course like PPCP is highly welcome even in a department which has other parallel programming courses, just because uh, we are getting the P and P, which is uh, uh, performance and uh, uh, the parallelism, and then the concurrency uh, in addition to the correctness emphasis. Uh, many of the other classes d don't have this uh, concurrency emphasis that we are, we are trying to promote here. Um, it would have been good to follow a textbook that is our recap experience. Um, this time the class was largely driven by the slide material, but looking back it would have been good to integrate this uh, book, which is very well written actually. I started reading it and going through the examples, uh, because students have something to take home and practice. We had that book available, but uh, we were also trying to uh, go through the course material, which was coming in the form of syllabi. And uh, it's a logistical, an interesting logical experience to plan for uh, yeah. They were developed in parallel. Uh, they, they were. It was uh, hard, yeah. Yeah, but, but, but we will have the benefit of that next time. Yeah, sequence data and so on. Uh, despite all that, uh, th things actually worked out well. And I will actually be able to show you some of the highlights of the course. And uh, we will be able to give you some of the, um, uh, a nice project for you to take away and uh, play with. At the end of this uh, talk, I'll demo, demo that. Uh, so my, actual, uh, my philosophy in looking back would be to take these courses in the light of the modern reality of what one sees in an undergraduate curriculum. Uh, undergraduate curricula are pretty packed with a lot of material already. And people are uh, wonderfully impressed by the achievements of uh, movie making, uh, digital movie making, machine learning, several other topics in distributed systems. So it really has to be a high profile pitch that we had to make saying that th not only this is uh, something fun and uh, so something you can play with from day one, uh, but also something that you have to have in your agenda or skill set, otherwise you will not be comp competitive as a programmer. So to that end, it'll be good to have a fairly uh, captivating demo available early on in this uh, such a class. And I hope to show you a small demo that we have prepared al along those lines. And it also is very important for instructors, uh, and I put the blame squarely on me, uh, to actually know how things work under the cover. Uh, while the magic of uh, tasking and the work stealing and so on appears uh, so alluring at the top, uh, unless one really understands the fundamental limits of uh, these uh, tasks, how much uh, stack space they have, what is their memory usage like, how are you going to get fault sharing uh, based uh, performance uh, losses and so on. So this was very ably covered, obviously, by the Microsoft researchers. But if an instructor were to take on such a course, they, they better get some tutelage from uh, people like Steve Tube and so on who are responsible for writing some of the basic uh, concurrency runtimes. Uh, that would be a very valuable uh, com complement to add. So what is the project that uh, we finally gave in this class? That is uh, often the defining moment of these courses. Uh, once we make students go through several exercises, they had to finally be able to solve something on their own. 
So my students and I came up with this problem. Uh, given a set of uh, images and given a set of uh, target images on the right hand side, define your own image matching criterion and do a bipartite matching of these images and maybe do some transformations on the target image based on the source images. Okay. So this was a very uh, well chosen uh, uh, pro project uh, looking back because it really put the students in a very awkward moment of uh, discomfort because they had to now suddenly understand how to read the bitmap files and uh, how to avoid the threads contending on the actual bits that they were manipulating, whether to uh, do the re bit operations in the managed space or dive into the unsafe code and uh, get faster performance, uh, how many threads to deploy, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that was all very, very good. Um, so I would like to show some of the surrounding issues uh, uh, around this uh, course, and of course I'm going to save some time to do this demo. So in a, in a sense, this project could be considered a success because uh, it was a good uh, uh, tangible item that they could uh, relate to and uh, put the material to use. Okay, so how, how should such a course be viewed in the light of uh, other developments that are happening in concurrency? So this is my own personal take on how I related to this course vis-a-vis -vis other things I do in my own professional, professional career. So one item of research that I pursue in my uh, research uh, agenda is uh, high-end concurrency, uh, dealing with programming uh, high-end clusters and so on. And from that perspective, I find that this course, uh, PPCP, has a number of uh, interesting uh, vantage points to offer. Many of the uh, large-scale MPI-based uh, programming systems are not set up with a fairly fluid, runtime-managed notion of uh, work stealing and uh, task management. And this would be a very interesting idea that uh, one can learn from um, the kind of material that uh, Tom showed you to take for the high-end programming community. So the lessons from the low end, well, uh, embedded systems programming also involves uh, several pressing resource issues. And uh, this is where uh, many of the mixed paradigm, mixed programming paradigms are also played out in terms of shared memory and uh, message passing. So this would, be, this would be also a very important uh, contrast to have. So, I basically have some of the uh, perspectives that I have captured in these diagrams. Uh, and, and we could all wonder as to how concurrency and parallelism ought to be taught at uh, various levels. So the bounty of concurrency that we all are experiencing in, in the programming, uh, in, in programming high-end systems is depicted by the slide. Uh, if one were to talk about a high-end system, one has, of course, these uh, high-end multi-cores integrated with their own GPUs uh, available as options. And some of the PPCP does address uh, the accelerator programming that is relevant to some of the modal programming modalities found here. You, of course, have the uh, need to manage uh, multiple traditional cores working um, uh, in concert. And uh, here, uh, the tasking libraries and so on would be uh, interesting to uh, explain. Um, I won't belabor these points. Uh, at the high end, uh, you pretty much have seen some of these uh, uh, big vision slides. Uh, at the lower end, what we are doing in terms of uh, our own understanding of concurrency and uh, becoming more real is that uh, we are trying to build a prototype multi-core system ourselves at Utah. And while not directly related to the material being taught here, um, Systems such as this, uh, uh, which is uh, in this case uh, an eight-core multi-core system, uh, where we have designed the 32-bit MIPS cores and the interconnect net, interconnection network, we are actually putting the message passing uh, communication APIs in the FPGA logic. So what we have done is uh, taken these uh, MIPS cores and modified some of their instructions to do fast messaging uh, between the cores using this request network. So again, uh, when, when you want to broaden your uh, offerings of concurrency and uh, take it to the embedded space, uh, several of the lessons that are being offered in a course like PPCP could come to bear uh, 
in an architecture like this. So this is our extensible Utah multi-core or Zoom, which we have uh, defined and simulated in VHDL. And uh, we are actually being able to, you can get these free boards from Xilinx, so we are actually able to demo it running in the actual hardware. So in, in a sense, uh, bringing up these uh, prototype machines uh, is an important activity that is happening in several academic uh, research groups, and there will be also sessions on FPGA programming here. So the important uh, th thing to bear in mind in actually addressing programming and uh, construction of these prototypes is to be able to get reliable uh, runtimes uh, manifested in these uh, execution environments. And this will be of uh, uh, great interest for us to discuss with you. And uh, it's related to the material that uh, a student might uh, pick up in a course like uh, what we talked about uh, just now. All right, so in conclusion, all I have to show is uh, uh, what I would like to say is uh, some of the takeaway messages from the PPCV itself has been offered and uh, some of the uh, ideas for the future. So I would say that uh, the, the course the PPCV has conceived and offered, uh, I'll be over one semester, was a very good demonstration of uh, how certain technologies that are considered to be first rate of first rate importance uh, to, for programmers has uh, be played out in one integrated whole. So first of all, uh, we have, uh, there is no question that we need to be adopting uh, for certain modalities of programming. We need to be adopting object-oriented programming. We need to be uh, enjoying the memory safety offered by managed code. Uh, the penetration of functional programming ideas in this context is very um, apparent. Uh, the languages such as C-sharp have a fair amount of uptake of uh, uh, functional programming ideas in the form of delegates and how they encapsulate items of work that can be uh, then managed using tasks. So that, that is a very good illustration of how programming technology has contributed to parallel programming. Uh, you would see it uh, very vividly illustrated if you were to study the material that is described in uh, the Steve Tube and Aid Miller book. And also the benefit of the good uh, development environments that uh, 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 that Microsoft Visual Studio really offers. Uh, plainly, it may be very intimidating for people to uh, approach such a, such a high-powered environment, and uh, that is something that we, we should address going forward, because uh, if there is a Visual Studio Lite that we can develop, much, much, much more feature-rich than Alpaca, but uh, something much, more, much less intimidating than Visual Studio, this would be a good compromise solution to aim for. So with that, let me show you what we actually managed to put together and what you could actually take with you and play with if uh, uh, you get Visual Studio or Visual, uh, I guess uh, Visual Studio Express might do also. And we, we'll put the solution online as, uh, when we get a chance. All right, so this is actually a beautiful demo of how the Mac technology and the Windows technology play out together. This is Visual, uh, VMware Fusion uh, hosting Visual Studio and uh, Windows 7, and I can tell the VMware host how many cores I, I, can I need to use and how much memory and so on. It actually works out very beautifully and seamlessly, and uh, I hope that my luck uh, stays with me during the <laughs> demo. That's, uh, of course, uh, the million-dollar question. All right, so this is actually a full application of the face, re uh, face replace application where I can just hit the play button and let's see what happens. All right. All right, so here is uh, the, the images are not coming out uh, well because of the um, pro uh, projector, I guess. Uh, so let's say that we have this uh, set of images to be matched against this set of images. And uh, this uh, whole code has been organized as a four-stage uh, design. Uh, you can actually read the code body and find out what each stage does. Uh, this application was, of course, created in, in honor of my visit to Paris. So I actually told my students I had to come here and show something cool that students can actually uh, feel proud of and uh, the attendees can take away. So this is, this is something that you should play with. Uh, stage one creates uh, regions from an image and rectangles, and only one task is used because there is nothing to be gained by paralyzing it. Stage two of this one uh, is going to analyze each source image as to what it features it has. Currently, the analysis uh, is simply the RGB values of each uh, face. And here I can uh, do uh, ch change the number of source workers and the number of target workers. So this, this is the number of uh, tasks that will be allowed to be created 
in doing this matching function. Uh, stage three will do the comparison function, so the bipartite matching will find a score for this source and target and sort it in terms of the best matches. And here also I can populate more workers. And then stage four is uh, something that actually does the replacement. Okay, so let's say that we want to run it this way. And then to be able to visualize the effects, you can, uh, what, what is called a speed is actually a slowdown. So you can actually slow down the application and so that you can see the uh, dynamics. Okay, with all this, you can hit start. And then what you see is the uh, number of workers that we have deployed running on the images. And uh, what each rectangle is uh, uh, sort of representing is the scope of each uh, worker thread, that we, uh, worker task. So if you increase the speed, uh, the, of course, the uh, slowdown factor that I'm introducing is reduced. And if you want to run this whole, okay, probably it has, it's still chugging along. So if I want to uh, perform screen update, and you can see the progress bars to show how many, uh, how much each stage has progressed. Uh, this is uh, where you can see the parallel activity. If I turn off screen updates, it finishes rapidly. And then I can sort of uh, uh, then see which image match which one by going through these images. So this is a bipartite matching that was computed. And if I want to find out which, all right, so let's run the, another example. So let's say I want to load an image. If you want to really do this, okay, I have to reset it, okay. So I want to, so say I want to load an image, and uh, let's say that uh, I choose this one. I hope so you recognize some of the players here. <laughs> uh, load image. All right, so let's see which faces here match which other faces. And uh, so here I had to define uh, the rectangles, or you can actually paint the rectangles around the image with a mouse. So I'll just uh, load up the rectangles from a file. Uh, let's say that these are the rectangles of interest. And then uh, I load up more rec rectangles for the target images. All right, so I've established the regions of interest. And let's see, let's say I will set some number of workers. Let's, I, I haven't reset the number of workers. All right, so if I say start, so all these guys are getting matched and uh, you can see that the stage one and two have finished, and, this, and then it enables stage three. And uh, when uh, stage four cannot really do its work till stage three. So all these are tasks which are work capabilities that are created and queued up, and the tasks execute in a data-driven manner. You will see the pipeline pattern of the book uh, very well put together, put to use in this uh, demonstration. And so once the work is all over, you can see who matched with who, and uh, these, was, these were the matches. And if you want to see who replaced who, well, you can see. Bill Gates matched with Bill Gates, and uh, all, right. <laughs> all right. So you can see who matched with who and who replaced, all right. Anyway, so it's just a little fun toy, but it is a toy that was very well designed using Windows Forms and uh, UI threading and uh, the internal threading, all done by Joe Mayo and co. So anyway, so what I have, the point I would like to make is uh, next time I offer a course like this, uh, it'll, we would be giving such an application on day one and, and tell the students. This is the kind of cool thing you'll be able to build at the end of the course. Go start modifying this code uh, starting today, add features and so on. So once they start playing with a code base like this and uh, start analyzing this code base also using Alpaca and so on, we would be in business in terms of gripping the students right from day one. Uh, we didn't have such a wow factor on day one when we offered it first time. Uh, let, let me conclude. I think uh, we are all here to receive your suggestions so that we can offer this better next time. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I was, was listening very carefully when you yes. talked about embedded systems. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Let's go over there. Predictable. Yeah. Yes. So uh, you know, scalability theory, the guaranteeing things mm -hmm. work within time deadlines, and mm -hmm. you are now to go multi core. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not saying that this should be crammed into this course yet, but at least this uh, it probably should be. But I mean, of course, this is if you really want to do real embedded systems, which mm -hmm. is a subject, you certainly need to, to have ways of dealing with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
Well, we have actually, I should say, we have a, an interesting European project, an Artemis project called uh, Recom, where we're trying to have safety critical applications living together with non safety critical, safety critical applications yes. on multi cores, actually. Right. So, so I think that would be a very fertile playground. I also uh, didn't, uh, yeah. yeah. So what, what, how do you see this? I mean, yeah, yeah, no, we, we want to have an add on. Yeah, yeah. It was explicitly a non goal. And then Kinexis added that strategic thing. Yeah, I am interested. No, no, but, but, but I think it's fine. I think yeah. it's fine. But then, of course, afterwards, you can think in the, in the, in the next course. And yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. I, I think I think part of the difficulty is that there's so many different domains that you're parallel. Yes. Yes. Right. And each of those has very different sort of traits, right? So part, yes. part of it is about this idea of spreading the ideas to, mm -hmm. like, different courses. Like, you know, the real-time course mm -hmm. have a different take than, you know, mm -hmm. the pro pro productivity mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. engineering stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, mm -hmm. what schools have fun, I, I, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> it's just that. Yeah. So I would say parallelism has so many uh, things uh, going uh, for it. I mean, one has to, for instance, understand the basic uh, compute uh, bare metal that one has, which is a very wide open space. The kind of things that are happening in the multi-core space itself are a huge uh, set of topics to cover in any course. Then one has to look at the interconnect and the memory subsystems, which is the next layer. And then how you program it also has oodles of layers. So one could build monolithic applications, which are uh, used to drive a lower level APIs, or you can then build program problem solving environments and the program even way up. So it's a very interesting, uh, rich space that we are trying to cover, but clearly one, there has to be one or two courses that grips everybody's interest and gives them some basic material that they can take away with. So from that perspective, I would say that unit, uh, uh, some of the units uh, cover accelerators, some of the units cover message passing, and that's the takeaway that people have in terms of adva advanced topics. Then when it comes to embedded systems, one again has the ability to see shared memory issues happening within a core. One has the ability to do hardware message passing these days, so that could be ably demonstrated. And one has the challenge, and we personally have a challenge. I mean, we are all academic groups are trying to establish some traction here. There is a huge amount of effort to get basic components in this space designed so I have a fairly talented group of students who have built a high-performance DDR2 SDRAM controller for, uh, for pipeline transfers. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. Right. 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 Yeah. That's absolutely right. Yep. Yeah. yeah it, it's a valuable. Yes, P, uh, there has to be a third P, I would say, <laughs> designed for verifiability, predictability. Yes. Yes, please. Yes, question. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. Yes. Yes. These are all very valid questions. I th there are there some students in the course who had taken a traditional OpenMP based course. They could then compare the OpenMP's uh, style of uh, tasking, which some of the OpenMP runtimes have, against uh, the kind of tasking that uh, .NET 4.0 and uh, several Java implementations have. Uh, to get all this packed uh, is in, uh, in one uh, syllabus is difficult, but these are valid topics to cover. We didn't do, do anything in terms of codes and templates. We were getting some of the basic concepts of linearizability and uh, atomicity and pre schedule bounded searching and so on integrated and presented in a usable manner. So I would say that uh, uh, after two, three iterations of a course like this, people would be able to be taught how to write these applications, such as I showed you, the phase replace and so on. And uh, there, what uh, one has, uh, have the biggest attraction of such an experience would be that without using any logs or any of the pthread style coding or OpenMP style annotations, you pretty much write what looks sequential and what is race-free, and it actually paralyzes it. And the capability to generate work 
and the, how the work is uh, managed and deployed on the cores are fairly decoupled in modern runtimes. These are the facts that t tend to stand out in a nicely packaged offering like this, I would say. Yeah. Right, right, the parallel dwarfs. I have seen the parallel dwarfs. In fact, some of my students play. Interesting. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Hey. Yes. Yes, uh, up or down. Oh, no, it, this has this course has a lot of demand, I would say. Uh, I'm, I'm, as I said, I was the facilitator in chief. I stepped in when uh, others were busy. But if we find the right uh, person to take a course like this and run with it, we will easily get 30, 40 people, undergraduates. And if it is offered twice uh, every week with assignments and so on, we have people waiting <laughs> to take a course of this nature. Yeah. That's great to hear. Yeah. 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 Sometimes a yeah. Course yeah. Like this right. scares off. Yeah. Right. No, no, yeah, yeah, no. No, I think the, the, the wow factor has to be established on day one by showing that you can write. So there is a robotic simulation that was in the PPCP where the anti-social -so robots. It's usually, it's usually yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. And then uh, yeah. Right. One, one other question. Yeah. Um, when, just so it's unsurprising that for many years I've used lots of static analysis tools and yes. teaching in mm -hmm. similar fashion. Mm -hmm. Or without using the .NET uh, sub run no, T TPL support also? Oh, okay. Because that's what they'll be like in the real mm. world. They're going to get out in the real world and they won't be able to use alpaca. Mm. Yeah. And they might, might find great stuff. Yeah. But what do you think? Does it change anything? Or do you think it's going to? We don't know yet. <laughs> I think the concurrency world is, uh, yeah, it's a little bit different ball of wax. And we, I mean, the frank admission is that, yeah. yeah. David Patterson's article in Spectrum said, I mean, the computer industry is throwing a Hail Mary pass at the problem. And we, we hope multi cores are uh, going to be uh, widely used and easily programmed and so on. We are yet to find out. Even the predictions of uh, number of cores multiplying every year, I don't see that have a well. <laughs> uh, there will be some general purpose cores. And uh, what is the market that is going to drive the number of uh, general purpose cores? Uh, we have to answer that. And then the GPU cores will be a certain segment. So if you look at uh, Intel's offerings in this Sandy Bridge, it's sort of is telling of the way things are going to be. Uh, one graphics core and four to eight cores. And then you had to get the full value out of it. and. Uh, embed such a processor in different kinds of spaces and understand how to program and manage it before we get the value proposition for the next set of cores. It's a lot of challenges there. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I think uh, uh, let's uh, have a break. Thank you all. We'll be around. Yep.